Well, thank you again for joining us for this month's Decoder webinar. If you have been riding along with us since the pandemic, get comfortable for another deep dive. If you are new here, welcome. This webinar is and has been an opportunity to break down different topics revolving around city planning, equity, and finance on a monthly basis. For this month's webinar, we are diving into a collaborative project between Urban3 and the University of Chicago. I'm delighted to introduce you to a fellow CMU member and professor at the University of Chicago, Dr. Talon, and my teammate, Tyler Schenker. So Dr. Talon directs the Urbanism Lab at the University of Chicago, which studies the built environment and its meaning and impact from a social, cultural, and political perspective. Taylor Schenker, who is my teammate at Urban3, carried her passion for sustainable urbanism from Charleston, South Carolina to Urban3, where she has the opportunity to analyze community resiliency nationwide. So what's one good example of that? It's the issues of zoning and affordable housing in Chicago, Illinois. Urban3 was tasked with looking at transit and housing in Chicago, Illinois, particularly density and housing patterns along the L train. Chicago, like many cities across the US right now, is in an affordable housing crisis. Dr. Talon described Chicago as dealing with an interesting phenomenon where residential properties around the L train are being downzoned from multifamily, frequently two to four unit housing, to single family housing. A frequent argument supporting this downsizing is that the updated parcels are more valuable and therefore contribute more property taxes than the previous multifamily housing. We wanted to quantify this observation so that Dr. Talon and colleagues at the Urbanism Lab at the University of Chicago can assess the issue and propose meaningful action. So before we look into this project, I'd like to ask Dr. Talon a couple of questions so that our viewers can learn more about the University of Chicago and your involvement with this project. So what's been going on in Chicago and what has motivated your the research with Urban3? Okay, thank you so much and uh, happy to be here to talk about our situation in Chicago, which um, may or may not be unique. I mean, one thing that, you know, is happening all across the country is this push to do away with single family housing, uh, I'm sorry, single family zoning altogether so that we can densify and allow ADUs and, you know, do all that good stuff. Um, and that's for sure needing to happen in Chicago. But there's another issue that is not, that's a little bit different. Um, and that is in Chicago, the tendency to not, not necessarily down zone, but lose density around very desirable, desir desirable locations around transit stops. So this is really crazy what's happening. Um, there's uh, just a lot of wealth floating around in this city and the really great walkable neighborhoods that are near transit um, are super desirable and they're full of these historic two to four flat buildings. And those are getting torn down and replaced with uh, single family houses. So it's, and we have instances too of people even um, tearing down two to four uh, unit buildings and replacing them with simply a, a yard that's adjacent to a single family home so that it's almost like this suburbia is coming into the city. Um, so the irony here to me is that zoning has just been such a pain in everybody's side um, for for many years for what it prevents. It prevents, um, you know, single family zoning prevents all kinds of things that need to be happening in the city to densify. But in this case, it's preventing, it's, it's not preventing what we need it to prevent, which is the loss of density and housing units near transit in locations that are very close to transit stops. So so it's a crazy thing going on. And um, a lot of, you know, I'm not the first to recognize this. A lot of people have been up in arms about what's going on. And um, hopefully we can start to turn this ship around and, and get our zoning to do what we need it to do. So I'm curious, when did you start noticing these zoning patterns? When did you start studying these zoning patterns? 
Um, this is actually, I mean, I, I wrote a book called City Rules, um, you know, quite a few years ago now. So I've been on, I've been studying this for quite a while. But um, this issue of tearing down density and replacing with single family homes, that's pretty new. And that's a personal experience for me. I, you know, moved into this neighborhood called Lincoln Park on the north side of Chicago, and I started noticing these housing units being replaced with single family housing. And I'm like, what the heck? You know, this is right near transit. Transit is where we need this density. And so it's really crazy. And, um, you know, so that's been a little more recent for me. Sure. My personal experience in Asheville, um, I live in downtown Asheville and I have been using the transit system since I moved here. And actually I came here for college. So I've been using the N1 and N2 to get from home to the grocery store and even to work. So it's something that is very valuable to me and important to me and probably to most of the labor force here in Asheville. So it's not just in Chicago where transit is important, where density is close to, um, to the transit line. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. Taylor, do you have any questions or input? No, I think um, like, you know, the problem that Dr. Talon pointed out to us is really interesting one. And I'm sure that while it seems somewhat unique, a lot of cities are fighting to get transit lines put in. You know, Chicago has this existing one and they're depleting the density um, that is needed to keep the uh, transit line running um, and functional. So that's, it's kind of an interesting problem. And I think, you know, in typical urban three fashion, we just wanted to do the math and see what stuff looks like. So um, we have some projections um, density changes, change, change maps, um, and it's been really interesting. It's an ongoing project, but it's been really interesting to look into this. Um, and I think the other thing with zoning and transit in particular, there's a lot of cities that are moving towards um, decreasing parking minimums. You know, a great urban space isn't one that has large open surface parking. But at the same time, you know, if you're going to decrease those parking minimums for buildings, you have to have reliable transit because otherwise you're just creating a problem. You know, people aren't going to, they're going to have a bad taste in their mouth from those areas that have lower parking minimums if people are parking all over the place because they have to have a car um, in order to get around because that transit isn't accessible to them. So it's definitely an important issue right now. Mm -hmm. Heard. So I know that the end goal with this collaborative project is to present at a conference at the University of Chicago. And Dr. Talon, um, I'm wondering if you can elaborate more about what this conference is about um, and how long it'll be and who else will be presenting. Okay. Yeah, it's an all day conference on uh, May 16th. Um, you're all invited and um, it's in a fancy new building on campus. It will be live streamed so um, people can join that way. And we have kind of a who's who of um, people who have been researching and writing and practicing around this topic. A lot of um, local folks, but then um, in terms of Keynoters, we have um, Sarah Bronin, who has been leading the charge in Connecticut, um, an effort called Desegregate Connecticut, which is about getting um, eliminating single family zoning. Um, also, the you might know about in Minneapolis, um, they have really been at the forefront of eliminating single family zoning. And there's a group there called, I love the name of this group, Neighbors for More Neighbors. And um, we, the, the uh, woman who started that group and was incredibly instrumental in um, getting rid of single family zoning in Minneapolis, she is a keynoter at our conference. Um, we also have Michael Lenz, who is a professor at UCLA, who has been doing a lot of work out in the California situation with battling single family zoning. So we have two people from either coast and one in the middle and the effort to do away with single family zoning altogether and the harms it's created, um, they're gonna be well represented at the conference. But then locally, 
it's going to be more about the topic of um, this battle over losing that naturally occurring affordable housing, the two to four unit uh, flat, uh, which is all over Chicago. And, and I have to say, if I had to pick one thing about the conference I'm particularly interested in, it's that we have four aldermen coming. Um, and they are, so those are the political power people in Chicago. There's 50 of them in Chicago. So it's the mayor and then it's the aldermen. And we have four of them coming and they're gonna have a panel and we're gonna really hopefully have a very, um, you know, come to Jesus kind of discussion about what needs to change to, you know, rectify this situation. And real quick, what's the name of this conference so that I can share a link for our audience? Oh, I did I send that to you, Taylor? Um, we can put it in the chat, uh, yes. a link about it. It's it's called um, the end of single family housing zoning equity and access. Um, so yeah, we have posters, we have flyers, we have, you know, we have tweets, we have a website, we have all that good stuff. Thank you so much. And I'll go ahead and paste a the link in the chat. Perfect. So I have a couple of more questions for you, Dr. Talon. I touched on how you were a CMU member and mostly because our team was able to attend this year CNU Congress at OKC at Oklahoma mm -hmm. City. And I know that you are um, a very, you have a strong presence in the new urbanism movement. So I'm wondering, what do you think the larger discussion on single family homes is with a connection to new urbanism? Well, the new urbanists have been involved in this topic for a very long time. And I think that there's certainly a lot of, I think most new urbanists would say there's that they don't necessarily have a problem with single family homes. It's about where they're located. And so the, you know, the transect idea would definitely come into a discussion here. Single family housing homes in and of themselves is not necessarily a problem. I live in a single family house and I right now I'm in a, my single family house actually in Michigan. Um, so, so it, but it depends on where it's located. And that is, that is what they would say. And um, also when single family housing is used as a way of preventing um, certain kinds of people from moving into the neighborhood and preventing affordability um, and you know, really having an impact on equity issues, um, that's another big problem actually, no matter where it's located, I would say. Um, so, so the new urbanists, I know that a lot of new urbanist communities have a lot of single family housing, but it's not all the same. I mean, some is super dense, you know, you can have single family neighborhoods that are very dense. Um, but the situation in Chicago is you can imagine the, the kind of house being built after you've just torn down a 1.5 million two to four flat building you're replacing it with a mega mansion. So this is not like tight single family housing that actually can provide quite a bit of density. So there's a lot of nuance that needs to go into this discussion. Um, and uh, I am a little uncomfortable with just saying, you know, single family homes blanket, you know, that's a bad thing. You know, that's, that's, I don't think that's what's being said. It's about the where and it's about the what kind. It's all about balance. Thank you for your insight. And it looks like we'll have a whole year to be able to kind of digest this topic uh, since CNU will be in Charlotte, North Carolina. And I understand that one of the major themes for next year's CNU is equity. Thank Great. you again for your insight, Dr. Talon. I would love to share uh, the audience about this research project. So Taylor, if you'd like to share your screen and tell us more about what you've been working on. Absolutely. Thank you, Maxine. I'll go ahead and put this in full screen mode. So thank you, uh, Dr. Kalen and Maxine again. As Maxine stated, we wanted to quantify um, the observation of you know, how housing and density is changing around transit in the city of Chicago. 
so that Dr. Talon and colleagues at the Urbanism Lab at the University of Chicago can assess the issue and propose meaningful action uh, during their symposium in May. So the following slides are draft infographics. This is an ongoing project, um, so please keep that in mind if there's uh, small errors, but we're really excited to be able to share it all with you today. So a little bit of background information for you, uh, for those of you joining from outside of Chicago, like we are at Urban 3. Uh, the L train was originally known as the Chicago and Southside Rapid Transit Railroad. It was built in 1892 and the first trip traveled 3.6 miles in just 14 minutes, which would revolutionize the accessibility of Chicago for residents uh, for generations to come. So in classic Urban 3 style, we created a value per acre map for Cook County, where Chicago is located. Because this was a smaller project, faster timeline, smaller scope, uh, we used 3.5 acre hexagons to calculate the average value per acre of parcels instead of going through the time consuming data cleaning process that's required uh, during a parcel level value per acre analysis. So though it's not perfect, um, it is you know, lumping larger areas together, it still give us, gives us a clear idea of where the downtown is located. So we took this average value per acre map and turned it into a 3D model to better articulate the peaks of high value areas. Um, so the biggest observation in regards to Chicago's transit line is actually what you don't see here. Um, so like other maps, you know, you see this purple spike with downtown, but what you should ideally see then is kind of trails of yellow spikes indicating higher value of transit oriented development around the transit stops. So let's back up a little bit and give a little context to the area. For those unfamiliar with Chicago, uh, the Chicago metro area has an estimated population of 8.86 million residents with just over 2.7 million of those residents located within Chicago city limits. From the population breakdown by age, we can note that Chicago has a significant number of young adults living in the city, particularly age 25 to 34. And that can also give us insight into uh, what the demand for housing may be by housing type. Looking at the number of Chicago residents uh, that rent versus live in the homes that they own, uh, or housing tenure as the US Census refers to it, we can see that the number of renters and homeowners who live in their homes is relatively equal. So while many people have a bias or a preconceived notion that homeowners are more permanent while renters are more transient um, and you know, may as politicians be more inclined to listen to homeowners, what we can see from this is that you know, both the number of renters and homeowners living in their homes is roughly equal. Both have the opportunity to register for vote to vote and both of their positions are relevant to change makers. Uh, we also looked at population density and how that has changed, particularly between 2010 and 2020. Um, so you can see the lighter yellow is lighter population and this each uh, hexagon represents the number of people per acre. Um, so in lighter yellow, four, you know, zero to four people per acre going up to 423 and how that value has changed between 2010 and 2020. Um, and so what you can notice as I kind of flip back and forth here is there's a greater density in the downtown area, but then there's also pockets of areas just outside of it where density has gone down, which is really interesting and not something that you typically see as the population is increasing. Um, but does reflect what Dr. Kalin was telling us about these areas that have down zoned buildings that are two to four unit multifamily housing to single family housing. Um, and that becomes even more evident as we um, show the transit station. This is a half mile buffer around each transit station, which we'll use throughout the data. Um, so just kind of flipping back and forth, you can notice that difference there. As we examine rental housing type, uh, we looked at it by the race of head of household. This is existing data that came from the American Community Survey in 2019. Um, we can see that there's patterns of housing type within specific communities. So for example, um, a large portion of renters that are 
uh, Hispanic or Latino do live in two to four unit buildings. And so that's super important to consider. Um, this may be linked to housing type preference or may be linked, uh, be related to availability of housing type within each, uh, you know, somewhat racially separated neighborhood. Um, but it's something interesting to consider as part of this research. So you can see visually when we map this data out um, and look at the percentage of overall residential units that are part of two to four unit buildings and how that follows different patterns within different neighborhoods. This is really important, particularly to communities of color. Um, these properties that are two to four unit buildings are most likely to offer lower cost rents for family sized units rather than a lot of multifamily units nowadays are built uh, with, you know, if they're multi if they're multi room units, then each room has their own bathroom and they're designated for like a roommate type situation and less likely to be for a family. Um, so that's really important that this type of housing stock still exists. Um, so of course, we wanted to understand any financial or land use data within its given social context. When looking at a racial dot map for Cook County um, with the half mile buffers around each L train stop, we can see pockets of racially segregated neighborhoods. Um, they didn't just get this way on their own. So we take a step back even further um, to look at the redlining maps. Um, as many of you may already know, in the late 1930s, the Homeowners Loan Corporation created uh, residential security maps of American cities that had populations over 50,000. So neighborhoods considered high risk or hazardous were often red lines uh, marked in red. They, it was also neighborhoods were designated hazardous or high risk for loans based on the race of populations that lived in them. Um, and so because they were considered high risk for loans by lending institutions, this denied them access to capital investment, which could improve the housing and economic opportunities of residents. Um, and so as we look forward to the current value, value per acre map, we can see the impact of those red line neighborhoods not having access to capital to buy, maintain, and improve property from the late 1930s all the way to 1968. And then even though um, that ruling that stopped being a practice for those areas that didn't have um, historic precedent of loans being successful and you know for banks taking that risk it still is more challenging to ask, access uh, capital so if we kind of flip back and forth here you can see particularly in the south side of chicago where a large portion of it is redlined it's missing some of that uh you know lighter green and uh, beginning yellow tones that you're seeing here in the northern side of Chicago, even as you stretch out from the city. Um, so if we highlight just the area, so again, this is the average value per acre in 3D map, and uh, showing highlighting just the area within a half a mile buffer of the L transit stop, we should be able to see the transit route highlighted um, with transit oriented development, which would create a yellow, um, a trail of yellow spikes. So transit oriented development is marked by higher density developed areas. Increased density means additional retail and services and additional population that increases ridership for the transit line. Denser areas where there may be even just a floor or two of apartments or office space located above commercial property generally increases the overall value and property taxes generated per acre of property. Um, and so that's what we're missing here. It's really interesting to see that there's not a really big difference between, or if at all, any difference between the value per acre of areas located within a half mile of transit stops and those located outside of it. Um, now, if we break down that value by zoning class code, which identifies building type, uh, we can see the average value for all residential building types within one mile of the L train stops. Um, so this is showing within one mile, uh, we're working to calculate the same average building values within a half a mile and one quarter mile of the transit stop. And what we'd hope to see is an increase in the value of multifamily and mixed use units as we got closer to transit stops. 
So if we go back to the 2D VPA map and add the L train route, uh, we zoomed into different stop areas to connect the average VPA to the urban fabric. So uh, while I, as an urban three person, um, may be able to easily kind of translate what some of these maps often look like as part of the urban fabric, it's important to connect it for everybody. Um, and so they can that you know the residents and the people attending this conference can see the actual examples of what places in their city look like and are valued at. So as you can see, generally, as you move out from the red and purple high value downtown area and towards the darker green low value areas, the density and height of buildings decreases. Um, this is interesting, just a light green node here. It doesn't make a huge difference, but just look at the value increase between um, an area that has you know, the commercial downtown with two floors of apartments, um, average value per acre over a million dollars versus another area also along the transit line that you know has some uh, small uh, commercial areas but no mixed use buildings. And then going up the red and purple lines again you can see the transition from the denser downtown area here um, where you do have mixed use and high rises um, and moving down in height and watching the value per acre kind of decrease as you move out towards single family residential. And then again, on um, the south side of Chicago, we have our downtown center here. With taller buildings, um, the value per acre is a little bit lower just because um, we're averaging across uh, roadway space also, and there's quite a bit of roadway space in this one area. Um, and then you have the Illinois Institute of Technology, so zero dollars per acre. Um, but then you kind of watch the value slowly decrease as you get out to uh, less and less dense single family housing. And then lastly, uh, our next steps and what we're working on now is projecting the average value per acre by transit stop and looking at uh, if we were to take just, you know, one of those hexagons three and a half acres around each transit stop and convert it to, as what one might say, like a humble mixed use commercial on the bottom floor and two floors of apartments um, or one floor of apartments using real values from existing developments in Chicago. So we're not pulling these from different areas where the context may make sense for taking it from neighbors um, and putting it next to those transit stops. This is the sort of value increase that could be seen across the city. Um, so once you take out, like I said, roads, sidewalks, and parking, it's only a few parcels. So it's not a huge change, um, but just a little bit of infill or redevelopment really could increase the projected average value for these areas. And that's it. So um, I, we have some time for Q&A, uh, but this is a really exciting project that we've been working on that will be presented in uh, the form of boards or posters as part of the symposium at University of Chicago in May. Thank you for sharing those compelling images and I'm excited for you to share this analysis with the audience at the conference. So like Taylor said, we'd like to take this time to see if you have any questions for us. And you're welcome to put your questions in the chat box. So it looks like we've got one. William Morgan asks, how could land value tax be used in conjunction with costs associated with Urban 3 to stop cities from losing money? All right, um, it also says, are there any other strategies that or incentives that private sector can you uh, to build more sustainably, both from a financial sustainability for the city and the environmental sustainability of urban design on their properties? Um, I mean, to build more sustain sustainably, that's a very broad statement. Um, and I would wonder, like, you know, is it environmental sustainability of the building? Is it being more efficient with the use of space and conserving land? Um, I think we need a little bit more clarification on that. But uh, as 
far as our research went, you know, for the zoom ins, we looked at specific zoning around each stop in addition to the average value per acre and then the street view. Um, and I think the primary incentive would be changing the zoning because when it's you're not allowed to have any sort of mixed use or anything like that, um, then that's pretty much shuts the, shuts the door on that type of development um, and can be the most restrictive. Um, I don't know if you have anything else to add, Emily. Well, I think it's a really interesting question because, um, you know, the zoning, the current zoning around these transit stops in Chicago, it allows mixed use. You know, it allows density, but the market isn't making that happen. So why, I think one problem might be that the, if people are, you know, building at such a lower density level with single family housing and even having just open lots next to them, somehow the tax incentive there is not structured correctly. Um, P, I don't know if people are being taxed sufficiently if they have this open, you know, lot next to them. I don't know what's going on there. Maybe that needs to be taxed differently. So the way that the city can build in taxing incentives and maybe even penalties, you know, um, in my dream world, you would be, you would simply not be allowed to decrease the number of housing units within a certain distance of a transit stop. That would just not be permitted. And I, I mean, but I don't know, you know, how politically feasible that is. Um, I've been asking around if other cities have that kind of a mechanism. And I don't know that I haven't found any so far. Um, maybe in Canada, there's something in Toronto, but um, so, so therefore, if you can't impose this, you know, or prohibit the loss of density in a transit area, could you use taxing in a way that would make it such that, you know, the market would not do what it's doing? And that I don't know. Absolutely. I do wonder also, I mean, I'm not a native uh, Chicago resident or Chicago resident, but the areas that are even, you know, zoned mixed use, there are a lot of them that it's, you know, classic strip mall commercial, small development with large parking lots. Um, and that isn't necessarily incentivizing people as neighbors um, when they see that sort of thing come up, you know, for review against their city council. Like, I may not want that next to my house. I could understand kind of you know, being a NIMBY in that case. Um, and so, you know, having good design where there's examples you can pull and say, hey, this, you know, added a few restaurants or small shops close to my neighborhood and also added some apartments and it wasn't disruptive to the residents. And having those positive examples that people can point to when new projects are uh, proposed, I think is also really helpful. Thank you. We've got another question from Cheryl Batista. What is the primary goal of the Urban 3 research for the Chicago Transit and Housing Project? Well, I, I can take a stab at that. Um, the, so the initial goal was um, in our conversations in Chicago, some people were saying, um, well, it's okay to replace a multi-unit building with single family home because at, well, at least the city's getting a bunch of tax revenue from these really expensive homes. And so I wondered about that. And so we you know, started talking to Urban Three about could you quantify this situation with, with tax revenue, single family versus multifamily. So that was the initial goal of the research. Yeah, we just wanted to do the math to figure out, you know, if we could validate that claim or not. Um, and it kind of depends by, by stop. It's not, there's not broad strokes across the area, but certainly what we found is that there's a lot of, you know, 
you don't see the value along the transit lines that you would expect to see, especially in a city as large as Chicago. So there seems to be some sort of kind of missing value there, regardless. Mm -hmm. So I have a question for you, uh, for you both. What were your first reactions with your findings? Well, I think it's depressing that we don't have a city that looks like high density around all transit areas and then it tapers off. Um, that's just, that's, I mean, transit, the, the, the L in Chicago, the subway, um, that's a huge public investment and um, going back, you know, a century and all that public investment and upkeep and, you know, that is a huge public resource. And so what you want to do is maximize the number of people who have access to that incredible resource. And so this, this map of, you know, this lower density in many places in these transit areas, that's just crazy. That's just crazy. And I, I just don't know how we got to this point. And um, I, I just, I hope we can fix it. Yeah, one thing, um, you know, like I said, this is an ongoing project, but and also I guess we have a lot of people here. So if you have specific numbers as in regards to the density that would be required to qualify for, you know, funding or to qualify for or justify um, a transit line like this now, uh, we'd love to know because we've been working on the research and there's a lot of different numbers. There doesn't seem to be a clear consensus, but one of the things that I really wanted to see is, you know, if you were to say the L doesn't exist, um, this is Chicago, this is the density and the value that we have, would you qualify for that level of transit? Um, like, you know, many people know if as your density goes up, you know, you can call, you start with buses then bus rapid transit, designated lane, uh, light rail and so on. Um, and I think that there's probably areas of Chicago that, you know, financially right now, they probably wouldn't put in the L. And that might be because they're down zoning these different areas. So that's something like we can't say that conclusively. We're still trying to figure out, find those numbers and do the math on that. But I think that's a really interesting phenomenon when, like, you know, I lived in Charleston and they're trying to build a bus rapid transit, but they don't have the density. And so they're really pushing for transit oriented development and density around these identified nodes. Um, whereas, you know, Chicago, a place that already has it is kind of eliminating some of that. So it's a really interesting problem. It's pretty dynamic and one step at a time, right? So Kirill asks, who is financing transit lines, city or state? It really depends on the project. And Dr. Taylor, if you want to jump in, uh, you can, but a lot of them are, you know, partial federal funding, partial state funding, and then also you need a local buy-in because um, they're not going to give you that money for free without some sort of um, contribution from the local tax system. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's ridership fees, but they also get federal and a lot of state. <clears throat> Yeah, I want to go back real quick to, um, I'm reading in the chat here, the points from um, William Morgan about the land value tax. And um, I, I am a huge proponent of that idea, taxing land, um, you know, that goes back to the 19th century. And actually, um, you know, Ebenezer Howard and Garden Cities were all about that model. And I, I think that is, could be so transformative, but I worry, I mean, the political muscle to do something like that, to change our taxation system has just been so much of a non-starter. And um, so that I find um, a great idea, politically unrealistic. So we have a, a comment and question from Leah Laversky at the beginning of the presentation, you said that the analysis was on a larger than parcel scale, I think maybe three mile hexagon. 
but did you take a one-off look at any specific parcels that have gone through this change from two to four unit to mega mansion in terms of the tax value to the city? Not yet, <laughs> not at this time, no. We've just focused our value per acre across the city, um, but we're diving into more specifics as this project continues. Okay, that's a good question. And, you know, hopefully you will get to that before May 16th. <laughs> yeah, I will say also like as without boots on the ground to know exactly which uh, parcels like have changed, it's a little bit of a pick and poke, um, but yeah, we'd like to have at least three examples of specific parcels. because. I think the other thing is like, yeah, if you take, you know, a run down two to four unit building and you replace it with a brand new mega mansion, yeah, the value might go up. But like, ideally, you have quality multifamily housing. Um, that may be an anomaly, basically. And I think it also like the financial value and the social value. Um, should both be taken into consideration. And so as we do the math on a lot of projects, it's you know, important to remember that you have to give numbers and you know, assign value to some of these social characteristics so that they're not forgotten. Um, and so those still get taken into consideration as part of the conversation. Like losing the density, yeah, maybe you know, you're you know, in these anomaly cases where you're replacing dilapidated, uh, you know, multifamily with a mega mansion, you may be increasing the value, but what if you were to renovate those? And also what's the value of, you know, increased affordability and um, having more residents be able to live within the city or with access to the transit line? Those are important considerations as well. Mm -hmm. We have another question from Nick Lanata. Any work toward protected bike lanes in Chicago and walkability? You need those things coupled with public transit. You need walkability if you're going to do a good public transit system. Totally agree. And Chicago, Chicago is not good when it comes to bike, bike transit. Um, it's really kind of sad actually. Um, so yeah, totally agree with that. But, um, and that will probably come up in our conversation on the 16th, um, you know, transit, the walkability around transit being a key piece of this as well. And I think a lot of these transit, that's what's so sad, you know, these transit areas started out having great walkability. The, the blocks are relatively short. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of, we're all, we're very gridded here in Chicago. And um, so there was good walkability, you know, buildings fronting the street, commercial areas. And that's what attracted people to come into the area. And, but then to tear down parts of the fabric to have your own single family home. It's like, you want to have that walkability and, and the, historical homes and things, but you don't want to live in that. You know, you you want to have your own mega mansion. So that's that's what's really killing it. So I have one last question. Uh, Dr. Talon, you mentioned your dream city or what what you would want it to be like um, after the after these findings with um, the this research project. And I'd like to give Taylor the opportunity to express what her dream city would, would look like or one outcome that she would like to see. Um, I mean, I'd like to see hopefully the, you know, infill development around and like infill transit oriented development around some of these stops. Um, I'd be really interested to see if they, how tracking ridership changes, if they're able to do that, or, you know, if there's been a decrease in ridership across the city. Um, and I don't know, obviously, you know, accessible places that include, you know, accessibility for a variety of people with a variety of incomes. 
um, and physical abilities. So, you know, like Nick said, it's not only important to have these transit lines, but have them accessible so that when you're walking or biking to and from the stop, that you can be safe um, and get to your location in a, a timely met, um, and safe way. Um, yeah, hopefully just a little bit of increased density. Like don't go and build a skyscraper in a you know single family neighborhood. Nobody's asking for that. That doesn't contextually make sense, but I think that there's small projects that could make sense um, and help in a multitude of ways. Thank you, Taylor. So I'm looking at the time and I'd, uh, we have a, 10 more minutes. So I'd like to end the decoder with a couple of closing points. I'm gonna share my screen real quick. As a reminder, we, there will be a live stream of Taylor and Dr. Talent's research. Uh, Dr. Baber has also been a part of this research and he's part of the Urban 3 team. And as a reminder, this will be in May 16th, 2022. We'd like to thank you for attending. This has been a great hour of fun and we appreciate your support throughout the pandemic with joining our webinars. And we hope that you've gained sight on varying topics. The next Decoder webinar will be July 31st. We will have Stacy Mitchell discussing the fallacy of big box stores and how they impact the culture, finances, and physical environment of the communities across the United States. And I'll go ahead and post a link of where you can register in our chat box. And lastly, if you are interested in working with us, please contact Kate Ryba, which is our Chief Operating Officer. And if you're interested in having Joe Minicozzi lecture in your community, please contact Caitlin Nellis Masters. So again, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Talon, for joining us in this hour and for Taylor for sharing your findings. We hope to see you again in July. Till next time. Okay, thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.